Welcome to our first part of neurophysiology. In this part, we're going to look at the organization of the nervous system. So we'll look at the afferent pathways feeding into the central nervous system and the efferent pathways feeding out. We will mention the autonomic nervous system, but in this topic, we're really going to focus more on the sensory pathways and the motor pathways. Autonomic, we'll talk more about in terms of specific outcomes, particularly in cardiovascular, when we do our cardiovascular session. So this first part, we'll look at the overall organisation. We'll also look at the differences between the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And we'll have another look at the cells within those. So let's have a look at the organization of the nervous system. Of course, the clues in the name, the central nervous system is at the center. This involves the brain and the spinal cord. And it's important to remember the spinal cord because in some cases, the action potentials coming in the afferent pathways don't actually make it to the brain. In some cases, they will synapse directly with an efferent neuron going out from the spinal cord. No involvement of the cortex or brain at all. And this is a reflex. We will talk about reflexes in the second part. So what's coming in? Coming in, this is our afferent pathways. And Overall, the overall umbrella term for it is the sensory division of the peripheral nervous system. Feeding into that, we have our autonomic afferent neurons. These are the ones that we're not really aware of, but what they're doing is constantly monitoring the situation in organs, in tissues, in glands and feeding that information via action potentials in through the sensory division. But this is the autonomic afferent branch or visceral sensory receptors. And then we have the ones we're a bit more aware of. The somatic sensory receptors are the receptors throughout the body that detect things like pain, like touch, pressure, temperature, that sort of thing, the things that we generally are more aware of. So they're constantly detecting things like that, and they then send action potentials in via the sensory division. And then we have the special sensory receptors. So, th so these are more about the senses. So we have smell, taste, vision, hearing, but also balance. So again, we're somewhat less aware of some of these happening, but they all feed information in via this afferent pathway, via the sensory division. So what about our efferent pathways. These are the pathways that are coming out of the central nervous system, whether it be the brain, whether it be the spinal cord. This is the motor division of the peripheral nervous system. You'd think with the name motor division, we're talking solely about skeletal muscle. We're not really. This is all efferent pathways come under the motor division. So, yes, the most obvious one. This is the somatic nervous system or branch of the motor division. This is the one that we talked about when we talked about excitation contraction coupling. These are motor neurons coming out to neuromuscular junctions and causing the contraction of skeletal muscle. <laughs> 
but we also have again an autonomic branch. So this is the efferent autonomic branch. This is the involuntary control of organs, glands and systems. We had on the left hand side our autonomic afferent sending in information about the status of the organs, the glands and, and whatever else is happening in the body that we're not actually aware of. It's all very well at sending in it, that information, but of course we then need an efferent pathway that is going to respond to that and regulate that to adapt to different situations. So we have to have an efferent autonomic branch and this is it. So that's our afferent pathways, which is sensory division and our efferent pathways, which all come under the motor division. So let's have a look at the central nervous system. The most obvious part, possibly, is the brain. The brain itself has about 100 billion neurons all packed in together. Each of those neurons have lots and lots of branches. If you remember our pyramidal cells with all their little dendrites sticking out all over the place because of all these little branches, there is the potential for about a thousand synapses per neuron. So each neuron can communicate either in or out with 1000 other neurons, which makes, of course, the pathways in the brain extremely complex. In terms of the brain, we have the forebrain. The forebrain is, is the cortex and the limbic system. The cortex itself is a folded six layer sheet. And if you took it out and, and opened it all out, ironed it, whatever, it would cover about 1.6 square meters. So it's quite large. It tends to form these folds with these little creases and these lumps, the creases, a crease is called a sulcus, one of the lumps is a gyrus. One thing to note here in this diagram, and I've circled them in, in yellow there, is the motor and the sensory cortex or cortices, plural. These both form sort of parallel slices, if you like, within the middle of the cortex. The cortex, of course, has lots of its own neurons, but of course it needs to have information coming into it and it needs to have information going out. In other words, action potentials in, action potentials out action potentials travel along neurons. So we have about a million neurons entering or leaving the cortex and they do this via tracts. Tracts are bundles of myelinated axons running together. They're the equivalent really of nerves within the brain, within the central nervous system, whether it be the spine or the brain. As we said, each of our pyramidal cells in the brain has the potential to synapse with a thousand others. So if we put that all together, there are more than 10 billion synapses just within the cortex where these pyramidal neurons can interact. And you can see here this computer simulation or the little like, lit, lit up bits are where synapses are active and you've got this complex interaction of branches and synapses. The pyramidal neurons where they synapse all form the grey matter because at this point they are unmyelinated. 
myelinated neurons in the tracts tend to form the white matter because the myelin makes the tissue white. Let's have a closer look at the sensory cortex and we've got this, sometimes you will see this depicted as, a, as an ugly little man and it's called a homunculus. What this is depicting having these limbs and face and what have you sat around the cortex, what it's showing is that different areas of each of the cortices, this is the sensory cortex, have specific areas for specific parts of the body. So all the neurons coming in, this is the sensory cortex, so they're likely to be coming in, will come in to their own specific area. And the reason that this odd looking body around the edge has over large parts, hands, lips, is because more of the sensory cortex is dedicated to those areas. And if you think about it, that makes sense. If we look at what we've written alongside that face, for example, we've got the eyes, the nose, the face, the upper lip and the lips. And of course, they're very sensitive. So they're going to have larger areas. Again, the hand there is large because we use our hands to feel things. We need them to be very sensitive. So a larger part of the sensory cortex is dedicated to that. And then everything else out is evened out. One thing to if interest to note, though, is look at the last thing on the right. The genitals have a very small area of the sensory cortex. And here's all our afferent neurons coming in via their tracts through the brain and then they go to specific areas depending on where they're coming from. And they're actually organized inside something called the internal capsule. And this is almost like a bit of a filing cabinet for the neurons because it keeps them all nicely organized to make sure they go to the right part of the sensory cortex. What about the motor cortex? Again, we've got the same situation. Certain parts of the cortex are dedicated to different parts of the body. But in this case, we're talking about the action potentials being generated and going out. This is efferent. So in this case, we've got neurons going out from the motor cortex. But again, it's as I said, divided up into different areas of the body, slightly different homunculus this time, still very large in terms of the hands, because of course we use our hands a lot to do things, so we need a lot of motor control on our hands. The mouth there is quite large because we speak with it, we chew with it, so all of that takes up quite a large amount of space. Our facial expressions are constantly changing. So again, the face is quite large on our homunculus. So what about below the cortex? So this is still part of what is termed the forebrain, but this is not the cortex, this is below the cortex, this is the limbic system. And you can see the orange there where it's located in terms of the cortex around it. In the limbic system, one of the parts is the thalamus. You can see it there, right slap bang in the middle. The thalamus we will mention fairly regularly. It's a pre-cortical relay point for sensory neurons. 
What that actually means is that sensory neurons traveling up tracks in the spine will go to the thalamus. In the thalamus, they will synapse with a third order or tertiary neuron that will then carry the action potential all the way up to the sensory cortex. So the thalamus is full of lots of little synapses where second order neurons synapse with third order neurons. The hypothalamus, the hypothalamus, of course, we have recently come across. This is our main regulator of homeostasis. And you can see it there just to the left and below the thalamus. The hypothalamus, as we already know, has chemoreceptors, thermoreceptors, osmoreceptors, and it also has multiple efferent and afferent neurons to other central nervous system structures. There's a lot of interaction between the hypothalamus and other parts of the brain. To do this, to have this communication with other parts of the brain, it uses autonomic pathways. As we know, it also uses neurohormones to regulate our endocrine system. The amygdala. The amygdala is right at the bottom there. Again, this is bidirectional. We have both afferent and efferent neurons in and out. This amygdala receives input from other central nervous system areas, including all the senses. And what it's thought to be responsible for is emotional learning, sometimes called conditioning. So this is about us experiencing something and learning an emotion from that, developing emotions in response to something, whether it be fear, anger, pleasure. The hippocampus, you can see just behind the amygdala. The hippocampus is, is named after seahorse because it is actually a bit seahorse shape. Again, we've got afferent and efferent neurons. And the hippocampus is really important to you at the moment because it's responsible for sorting memories, sorting memories and then transferring them into stored memories. And there's quite a lot of controversy over how it does this and where these memories are exactly stored, whether they be stored in the hippocampus itself, which seems a bit unlikely, or whether the hippocampus just organizes them and then helps to retrieve whole memories. Because if you think a memory is made up of various senses. So you may have a visual input, you might have an auditory input, you might have a particular smell associated with a memory. And all of these possibly are stored in those areas within the cortex. And then the hippocampus has to retrieve all those bits and put them together as a coherent sort of whole memory. Those are some of the theories anyway. So it's known to control memory retention though, through the processes of long-term potentiation. And if you read your mobilizing memory handout right at the start, you will remember that we talked there about long-term potentiation of synapses. And this is what you are doing when you keep repeating something over and over and over. That's why you get a stronger memory. The more you stimulate a synapse, then the stronger that synapse gets, you get changes, you get more channels, more neurotransmitter. In some cases, the dendrites will get bigger. So you get these long-term changes to synapses, to neurons that sensitize that pathway. And this is why in terms of memory, of course, if you sensitize it, it's going to be easier to retrieve 
that memory. It's also thought to be the origin of epileptic seizures, but there's quite a few theories again on epileptic seizures. So the midbrain, we're coming down now, um, we're nearly into the brain stem, the midbrain is sitting above the pons. It's the smallest area really. It's involved in mood via dopamine. It's also involved in hearing, processing of visual input and eye movements. So it has some key functions. Interestingly, it also contains an area called the substantia nigra. The substantia nigra contains neuronal cell bodies, somata, that synthesize dopamine. Dopamine is then carried via neurons in vesicles to an area called the putamen and another area called the chordate. Together they're known as the striatum. You don't necessarily need to remember all of this. But the striatum is involved in motor control. So dysfunction of the substantia nigra is associated with Parkinson's disease. Which brings us down to the brain stem and the cerebellum. So in terms of the brain stem, the big fat knobbly bit at the top, just below the midbrain, is the pons. We'll come back to it occasionally. It contains various nuclei. So if you remember in the central nervous system, a nucleus is an area of the central nervous system that has lots of synapses and lots of somata. So it contains nuclei that connect the forebrain with the cerebellum. It also contains, which we will come back to, the pontine respiratory center. Pontine as in in the pons. The pontine respiratory center is involved in the fine regulation of respiration. It's what enables us to speak and breathe at the same time. So it modulates our breathing to enable us to speak and, and exercise and various other things. It just tweaks the rate up and down to allow that happening. So quite a clever area. And below that, we have the medulla oblongata. Very, very important area of the brainstem that we will come back to repeatedly. It's involved in autonomic regulation of respiratory rate and depth. So we will talk about it in respiratory. Heart rate and strength plus vasomotor tone, which we will come back to in cardiovascular. It also controls digestion. Another thing, it, considering it's a fairly small size, it does do an awful lot. Another thing about it is it's where most motor neurons cross over. It's called the decussation of the pyramids. We'll talk about that when we talk about the descending motor pathway in part two. The cerebellum. This is involved again in processing position and movement and the fine motor skills. So that was the brain, that was the brain stem. We're moving down now to the spinal cord. The cord itself has about a hundred million neurons. And as we said, it forms a key part of the central nervous system. Most of these 100 million neurons are little short interneurons. 
and there's a, a picture of an interneuron there, a particular type. Interneurons, I suppose the posh way of saying it is, well, I've got there, integrate sensory information. What they actually do is they can sit between, for example, an afferent neuron coming in and an efferent neuron going out. By joining them up, they're not just acting like a bit of an extension lead, because interneurons can be excitatory or inhibitory. So in some cases, those interneurons act like off switches. So if we have an action potential coming in, nothing will happen because we have an inhibitory interneuron that will block it. And there are times when we need this to happen. If it's excitatory, fine, it will pass it on. We might refer to it then as an on switch. But the spinal cord has a hundred million of these little interneurons. The spinal nerves, the minute you get outside the cord into the spinal nerves, you are now in the peripheral nervous system. There are 31 spinal nerves that come off the spinal cord. Each of those spinal nerves carries just about everything, all the neurons packed together. And those neurons within the spinal nerves could be motor, they could be sensory, they could be autonomic, and they're all packed into a nerve. This is where you have to start being careful about your use of the term neuron and nerve. A nerve, it's like, I suppose, a nerve is like a muscle, whereas the myocyte would be the neuron. So the individual cells are neurons, but they're packed into nerves. Those neurons can be all different types, different types of fibers. They can be motor, they can be sensory, they can be myelinated, they can be unmyelinated. The cord, this is coming back to this gray matter, the spinal cord has a center of gray matter. This gray matter is made up of the synapsing peripheral neurons and the interneurons. So this is where really all the action happens. The surrounding white matter on the outside of the cord is where the tracks are. These tracks have descending or ascending neurons that are myelinated. Therefore, they make that area white because of the myelin. So if we took the spinal cord and we did a cross section of it, it probably wouldn't look much like this. This is my version. You can see in the middle we have the grey matter Around the outside, we have the white matter. At the back, so towards the back, you've got these two bits sticking out on either side. These are the dorsal horns. At the front, you've got the ventral horns. And there's a key difference in terms of the dorsal horns and the ventral horns. Okay, so in comes our afferent sensory neuron. It comes in to the dorsal horn. All afferent neurons come into the dorsal horn and go out of the ventral horn. That's the key difference. And you can see this one has its soma, its cell body, sticking up out of the axon. And this is a characteristic of sensory neurons. When they enter the spine, the cell body, the soma, sits in a ganglion called the dorsal root ganglion. A ganglion is the peripheral nervous system equivalent of a nucleus in the central nervous system. So our action potential comes in along there, gets to 
are axon terminals in the dorsal horn. This particular one is synapsing with an interneuron. However, it could also synapse directly with a second order afferent neuron, in other words, the second one in the line, that then ascends up through the white matter, through the tracks in the white matter, to the sensory cortex via, if you remember, the thalamus. So they can synapse with interneurons, or they can synapse directly with second order neurons that will ascend up to the brain. So here's an efferent motor neuron. Efferent motor neurons always leave via the ventral horn. And you can see this one is on the other end of that interneuron. So this is an example that I was talking about where the action potentials do not necessarily need to involve the cortex. This would be a reflex action. So we have an action potential coming in via our afferent to the dorsal horn that then synapses with an interneuron. That interneuron synapses directly with a motor neuron that then leaves via the ventral horn. So no brain involvement there. We'll get on to reflexes, as I said, next week. The other scenario, of course, is us sending down an action potential from the motor cortex. The old scenario of I decide to pick up a pen, I need to contract some muscles, therefore it comes down from the motor cortex. Or it could be an autonomic efferent coming from the medulla, for example. It comes down, tracks in the white matter, comes in, then moves into the grey matter and synapses in the ventral horn. It synapses there and our lower motor neuron leaves via the spinal nerve. The one coming down descending is the upper motor neuron. The one going out, the second one in the pathway, is the lower motor neuron. And you can see here that both of them are running within the same spinal nerve, regardless of whether afferent or efferent, autonomic or whatever. OK, so let's go through the difference between nuclei and ganglia again. So in the peripheral nervous system, we have ganglia, ganglion singular. These are relay points and they contain the cell bodies of the neurons, the somata, soma singular, and the synapses. And here we've got the example of the dorsal root ganglion. If we have whole collections of ganglia, this is where we start to talk about a plexus. And as we said, the dorsal root ganglia, the one that we talked about in particular, contains sensory neuron cell bodies, not necessarily synapses, but it does contain somata. Once we get into the central nervous system, the equivalent are the nuclei or nucleus singular. And these are areas of grey matter containing groups of somata and synapses. And you can see here in this diagram, we've got multiple nuclei making up the dorsal and the ventral horns making up the grey matter of the spinal cord on both sides.
and different areas receive or send out different types of neurons, albeit they will all come in or go out via that spinal nerve. Note here that the sensory nuclei, and we've got somatic and visceral there, are in the dorsal horn at the back, whereas the motor nuclei are in the ventral horn. Remember we said afferent comes into the dorsal horn, efferent goes out of the ventral horn. So let's have a look at a peripheral nerve. As we said, nerves may contain sensory afferent neurons and motor efferent neurons. Those neurons may be myelinated or may be non-myelinated. Generally, what's running through the nerve, though, are the axons of our neurons. Of course, the somata tend to be sat in ganglia. So the axons are bundled into fascicles. I did say this was a bit like a, a muscle with myocytes, skeletal myocytes, uh, packed into it, into little bundles called fascicles again. And that's all bound up with layers of different types of connective tissue. Alongside the fascicles, of course, we need a blood supply. So we have blood vessels running within the nerve as well. The spinal nerves, bearing in mind we only have the sort of 31, they need to repeatedly branch to be able to innervate the entire body. So they need to keep branching out. So the fascicles will split off and go down one nerve and we give them all names um, and think of them as a, a original nerve. But of course they all come off the spinal nerves. As we've said, the cell body is called the soma somata in plural and like any other cell it contains all the usual organelles so it still needs a nucleus it still needs mitochondria golgi apparatus vesicles all the other apparatus that a cell would need and that's contained within the soma In motor neurons, the soma itself is surrounded by dendrites because of the way they are with the soma at one end and axon terminals at the other end. These dendrites that stick out from the soma have little tiny spines on them. And this is where the axon terminals of presynaptic neurons, in other words, the neuron before that neuron, can synapse and those dendrites can synapse with lots of different neurons all inputting to one postsynaptic neuron. In this picture we're just showing one neuron synapses with another neuron. The action potentials traveling from the soma from actually the axon hillock along the axon to the axon terminals and then those axon terminals synapse with the postsynaptic neuron. In actual fact, what really realistically would be happening is that multiple neurons would be feeding into that postsynaptic neuron. And we'll talk about how that's all organised next week. The axon hillock, you can see there, the area between the soma and the axon in motor neurons, is where the action potentials are generated. Before that point, within the soma, 
there are only graded potentials, little local potentials. The axon hillock then takes all those little graded potentials coming in and decides, generates an action potential. If there are enough excitatory inputs, it will generate an action potential that will then propagate along the axon to the next neuron. So the axon propagates the action potential that's been generated in the axon hillock all the way along to the axon terminals and onto the next postsynaptic neuron. Neurons do vary, and we did a little bit of this in tissues, didn't we? We looked at different neuron shapes. The first two on the left are what's called multipolar neurons. You don't necessarily have to remember that terminology, but these would be either pyramidal cells or interneurons. So in those two, we're talking really about those being within the central nervous system the brain or the spinal cord. The third one, or the second one from the right if you prefer, is a multipolar neuron, but it's a motor neuron. So this would be a peripheral neuron, and there you see our classic shape, the one that we use to explain all of this because it's simple of having a soma at one end, dendrites spreading out from that, then an axon and that axon running down to axon terminals. And you can see this would be a lower motor neuron because it's going directly to neuromuscular junctions. The one on the far right is a sensory neuron. If you remember, we said that the soma is sort of, oh, it's not quite in the middle of the axon, but it's a long sticking up out of the axon. Therefore, that's not where the dendrites are because we have a different arrangement here. The soma would be in the dorsal root ganglion. And then the last branch, the central branch, would enter the dorsal horn. Because it's sensory, of course, at the very top are its sensory receptors. And sensory receptors vary, we'll look at those in a minute. But of course, they are experiencing depolarization through various causes, which may generate an action potential that travels along the peripheral branch of our sensory neuron up into the soma in the dorsal root ganglion out again and on into the dorsal horn to go off and synapse as we saw before with interneurons or with a second order sensory neuron ascending to the brain So a quick revision on our supporting cells. We have looked at these before when we looked at tissues. So Schwann cells, if you remember, are in the peripheral nervous system. They myelinate peripheral nerves. The glial cells are our central nervous system supporting cells. So we have astrocytes, they control circulation and nutrition. They reinforce the blood-brain barrier. Remember sticking those feet out around it. And there you can see that in the diagram with the feet around the capillary. They're also involved in neurotransmitter levels and synaptic function. So they have some pretty important roles. Oligodendrocytes, if you remember, are the Schwann cell equivalent in the central nervous system. So they myelinate central nervous system 
axons. But they do it by sitting between axons and throwing myelin out to multiple axons. So therefore, they hold everything together as well as myelinating. Microglia are the tissue macrophages in the central nervous system. I promised you sensory receptors and here they are. So sensory receptors vary. They are differentially sensitive, if you like. And this is referred to their, as their modality. So in terms of modality, we might have mechanoreceptors. So these detect things like mechanical stretching or pressure. Um, and examples that do this are the Pacinian, the Meisner or the Ruffini corpuscles. And you can see those there on the left. And you can imagine, look at the Pacinian there. That's in far left on the middle row. The Pacinian, you can imagine squishing that. It looks very squishy. And that squishing would open ion channels that would generate possibly an action potential. We also have thermoreceptors, so clues in the name really. They detect changes in cold or warmth and they tend to be free nerve endings. Those free nerve endings then have little specialist thermoreceptive channels on them that can detect cold or warmth. Nociceptors again are free nerve endings. They detect primarily pain. So what they're registering, what they're telling us is that there's physical, thermal or chemical tissue damage. They're free nerve endings just about everywhere except the brain. The brain is actually insensitive to, to pain, the actual brain parenchyma, the cortex itself. And again, they do this, they are, tend to be polymodal. So you'll have a free nerve ending all spreading out. You can see them there top left. You have a free nerve ending spreading out and they have different receptors on them for different things. Some of those receptors may be mechanically sensitive. Some of them may be chemosensitive. Some of them may be thermosensitive. We also have things like electromagnetic receptors. So these detect light falling onto the retina. These are our rod and cone receptors. And if you remember, we talked about when we talked about endocrine, chemoreceptors. So chemoreceptors operate really in the afferent branch, the sensory branch of the autonomic nervous system. So they will detect taste and they are highly complex receptors. Smell, blood gases, we'll talk about that in respiratory, blood glucose, amino acids, fatty acids, and of course, our hormones. And if you remember when we talked about chemoreceptors in the hypothalamus, we talked about them just being chemically gated channels in effect and that hormone would bind to that and stimulate the receptor. So sensors or receptors in the plasma membrane of sensory receptor cells open or close ion channels. And when they do this, they generate a local area of depolarization. This is what we mean when we talk about a graded potential. We're not talking about an action potential propagating along an axon yet. This is just a little area of depolarization. If there's enough little areas of depolarization, it may generate an action potential. 
but in some cases, if you just have one, it's not going to generate an action potential. So we have all these different methods of opening channels. So our mechanoreceptor, we talked about mechanically gated channels, didn't we? Basically, if you squish it open or stretch it open, then the ions, the sodium usually, will be able to influx and set off a little area of depolarization. Thermoreceptors have a little temperature regulator that opens the channel and so on and so forth. Electroreceptor, that's just a voltage gated channel. Chemoreceptors tend to be a little bit more complex and they involve our old friend, the G protein. The G protein then goes and opens a channel. If we have this situation where we have a G protein opening a channel, it's called metabotropic. If we have something binding or stimulating a channel directly without a second messenger, they are called ionotropic. So our metabotropic receptors require something to happen to a receptor that then activates a second messenger, usually a G protein, that then opens a channel. As I said, if enough are stimulated, if we get enough graded potentials and they are excitatory, more on the difference in, in part two, there will be sufficient depolarization to generate an action potential. OK, so that was part one, part two next week and part two will start looking at the motor pathways, the sensory pathways, reflexes, and it'll be a bit more about the action in that case, rather than the actors. As always, get this one under your belt first. By now, you should have identified a study buddy and be going over the material with them speaking it because that will then help you not only to understand it, but to be able to explain it to others or to be able to write it. So make your own notes, keep your glossary up to date and make sure repeat, repeat, repeat. Remember the hippocampus and long term potentiation. Repeat, repeat, repeat in multiple different ways and you will sensitize your memory pathways. <laughs>